Hello everyone. We're in Acts 21, 5 to 16 today. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever heard a prophecy? Have you maybe received a prophecy for yourself or even given one? Well, in today's passage, Paul receives a prophecy, but he has an odd response to it, which is rather odd. And hopefully by the end of this, I'll explain to you why. And as I go through this passage, I want to look at three things. First of all, I want to have a look at the levels of prophecy. Secondly, I want to have a look at the anatomy of a prophecy. And finally, if you stay with me long enough, I'll tell you why Paul responded the way he did. Before we start, I want to look at the verse before, verse four. Here we find Paul in Tyre. He's setting off to go to Jerusalem. And we find that the believers gather together through the Spirit, give Paul a word from the Lord, a prophecy. This whole phrase, through the Spirit, means a message from the Lord under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the conclusion they come to is that um, Paul should not go to Jerusalem. We find that in verse 4. Now we pick up our passage from verse 5. As they leave from Tyre on the way to Jerusalem, everybody, all the believers, go out with their family and they uh, see Paul off on the beach. They and their family, they, they kneel down and they pray for Paul as they leave and Paul sets sail. On the journey, he arrives finally at Ptolemaeus um, and then stays overnight there before going on to Caesarea, where he stays over with Philip the Evangelist. Now you remember Philip the Evangelist, he was the one that was having a revival in Samaria when the Holy Spirit told him that he should go into the desert and meet a eunuch from Ethiopia and there give him the message of salvation. That same Philip had four daughters and it says in the passage that he had four daughters and they prophesied. First, let me have a look at the types of or levels of prophecy that uh, we seem to come across in the scriptures. Now, the first passage I want to have a look at is in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel 10.10, Saul has met up with um, Samuel while looking for his father's donkeys. And after the uh, event takes place, he leaves Samuel and comes down the mountain. As he comes down the mountain, he comes across a troop of prophets. And these prophets are prophesying. I imagine that they're singing and they're prophesying. And as he gets closer to them, the power of the Spirit upon them comes upon Saul. And he too prophesies. The second occasion I want to bring to your attention is in the New Testament, in Acts 19.6. Here we find Paul meets up with some believers from Ephesus. After explaining the way of salvation and, that they, and the way of the Spirit, because they hadn't heard that there was a Spirit before, they were, were present together, about 12 of them, and Paul lays hands upon them. And the power of the Spirit comes upon them in such a way and manifests in such a way that it says that they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. Now, this isn't just restricted to the prophecy, uh, to the Bible. It's a, an occasion where I was a student and I went to a, a meeting. Um, and in that meeting, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit came down upon us in a mighty and powerful way. And the gifts of the Spirit were freely moving including tongues and interpretation and prophecy. Um, all sorts of weird and strange things were going on. It was the first time I'd experienced it, so it was quite new to me. Um, and somebody had to explain to me, well, it's OK. This is just what the Holy Spirit does. Fabulous. But Philip had four daughters, and these daughters moved in a different level than we've just talked about. They had the gift of prophecy, a second level that I would describe that we find in the scriptures. In Romans 12, 6, it says that we are to prophesy according to the level of faith that we have. And Paul lists prophecy as one of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 10. He also tells the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 21, he warns them not to quench the spirit, not to despise prophecy, but to test and hold on to that which is good. And this was the level that the four daughters of Philip were working at. Now, this gift of prophecy can vary among believers. There are some who will prophesy infrequently, while there are others who will prophesy more frequently. 
again, in my experience, um, I can tell you a story where we were again in a gathering, a meeting, a church meeting, and the music was being led by the worship team at the front. And the Spirit of the Lord come, comes upon the, the group there and a message is given um, to the church. It's not a, a prophetic in the sense of something foretelling the future. It's just the Lord, if you like, singing a song of love over us. But what was fascinating was it was the same message, but it was coming from the different members of the, uh, the team. Uh, it was fascinating to watch. I've seen it a few times, but it really is amazing to watch. Now, the story continues where we are reintroduced to a prophet. This is the third level of prophecy, a prophet. And this prophet's name is Agabus. Now, we met him before in Acts 11.28 in the church at Antioch, where he brings a prophecy warning about a famine that will hit the land. And as a result, the churches gather together funds and resources and Barnabas and Saul, who later became Paul, take those resources to the church at Jerusalem and that was his first visit. Now Agabus is a proven prophet who is accurate in the things that he said and it is Agabus that gives us a prophecy, a, a recollection of the, the story is there. He starts by taking Paul's belt, ties himself up in it and says that the person who owns this belt will be, will, when he goes to Jerusalem, will be bound and will be handed over to the Gentiles. And this prophecy is taken as a warning. And strangely enough, it's the same prophecy given to Paul in Tyre. So Agabus now gives us more detail in the story. Agabus, Agabus's prophecy gives us more detail um, about what that message was entire, if you like. But Paul concludes the same thing. He concludes that he should still go to Jerusalem. Everybody concludes, no, 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 Paul, don't, don't go, don't go. But Paul disagrees. He appears to not only disagree, but disregard the prophecy, which is rather strange and we wouldn't really expect it. Now I want to just have a look at the anatomy of a prophecy and see how it comes together. Let's have a look at the anatomy of a prophecy. A prophecy, when it's received, is received in three parts. Now, this is artificial. It's not a real breakdown. It all flows together. But if I break it down into three parts, it will help us to explain what's going on. The first stage in a prophecy is what I would call the revelation. And that's the part that is received. It can be something heard. It can be something seen. It can be something known or it can be something felt. There are other variations, but they're the main ones. And it's important that the recipient of the prophet, prophecy, the person giving the prophecy, is accurate in his, portray, his or her portrayal of what he hears, sees, or knows, or feels, without adding anything or taking away from it. And at this stage, we're trying to, answer, we're trying to answer the question, what are we hearing? What are we seeing? What is it that we know? or feel at this point. Now the second part of a prophecy is the interpretation stage. And here we try to understand what the prophecy means. And we're asking the question, what does the revelation mean? And that can be done not necessarily by the same person. It may be as part of a group. Um, it says in the Bible that the prophets should, should weigh or measure or test uh, that which has been received. And the third part of a prophecy is its application. And here we try to understand, well, now as we've, we've received the revelation, now we think we understand what it is, what is it we're going to do with it? The question we ask is, what do we need to do? Throughout all this, we also have to establish that it's a true prophecy. Now, for the sake of this argument, and it came from Agabus, we're going to assume that this is a true prophecy. It's recorded in the Bible as such. Agabus um, does something slightly different. He acts out the prophecy by taking Paul's belt and binding himself before he gives the word, before he pronounces that Paul will be bound and handed over to the Gentiles. That part is the revelation. Now, those present with them have to interpret the meaning. And they conclude 
that if Paul goes to Jerusalem, then his life will be put in danger. So far, so good in terms of the, in terms of the prophecy. The third part of the application. The application that the disciples decided upon was that Paul should not go to Jerusalem. This was, in fact, the same conclusion that they came to in Tyre. And Paul, however, disagrees. The question is, why? Now, just to let you know that this isn't just about what's in the Bible. I can tell you another story about something that happened to me. I was studying for pharmacy. Many of you know that I am a pharmacist. And um, I was studying for pharmacy in London. As part of that process, the various co pharmacy companies would come round to the universities and they would do what they used to call the milk round. And they would interview people. And I went in to be interviewed by a company called Boots. You may have heard them. They're rather a large company and they're dotted all over the place. Anyway, I applied for them so that I could do my training with them. Uh, I went to the interview and weeks went by and friends of mine had started to hear whether they were going to be taken on by Boots to be trained. I hadn't heard and it was getting quite disconcerting because it was quite a while. So I was praying one day and I was asking the Lord, Lord, I haven't heard from Boots yet to see if I've got an interview. So as I was praying, I heard in my head, I heard you're going home. Now, this was important to me. Let me just fill in the gap. The gap is that that particular year I was getting married to uh, my fiance, Liz, who is now my wife. So the end of the story has been ruined because I've just told you the answer. Um, and it happened that we were getting married that year. And I believe that the Lord was telling me quite strongly that I was going home. Now, that was the revelation. It came as something I heard in my head. And my interpretation related to the fact that we were getting married and that I would be going home. Bear in mind, I was in London at the time. Now, the application to that was to ring Boots and find out what's going on. So I rang them and I said to them, I haven't heard yet. Can you tell me what's going on? And they gave me a few options. They said, actually, we are about to send you a letter and we've got a few offers that we can give you. And they listed off a few names. Interestingly enough, the closest to home was Oxford. This was a bit odd, bearing in mind that the spirit had told me I was going home. I said to the guy, um, can you just check that for me? Because that doesn't seem to be right. I think I should be going to Birkenhead where there's a boots and I should be training there. He said, I will go and have a look. And he came back to me a few days later and he said, sure enough, you're quite right. The, f the interviewer had not completed the form properly. Um, it, they hadn't finished it off. He said, unfortunately, though, I can't offer you boots training in Birkenhead. But I can offer you Chester. Will that do? Now, if you know the area, Chester is further away than Birkenhead, but it's home and I could go home and do it. So it's quite interesting to see how uh, the revelation that I received was accurate. Yes, I will be going home in the context of my training. The interpretation of it was a little bit off target. I was thinking Birkenhead, the Lord knew Chester, but the application was contact Boots and find out what's going on. Now, that is an actual fact that happened to me. You, you don't take on uh, a future potential employer unless you know that the word of God is accurate and true. Do you really? So for those of you who are still with me, this brings us to the question, did Paul ignore or disregard the prophecy that was given to him, both by Agabus and previously in Tyre? Well, to answer that, you have to go back to Acts 19, 21, where we have a clue. Here, it says that Paul resolved in the spirit. Now that phrase is an interesting phrase because it implies that the spirit had spoken to him or he connected with God in such a way, in whatever way, and God had told him what was happening. And he had resolved in the spirit to go to Jerusalem, and to Rome. In the spirit, God had revealed that he was to first go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. This was the bigger picture. He knew what God's plan was for him. And whilst everyone else was focused on the danger that Paul was about to face, which Paul agreed with, God had already told Paul what he was going to do. He didn't give him all the details, I would assume. And 
the fact what remained that Paul knew that in spite of what others were saying, he was going to go to Jerusalem and then on to Rome. Paul had confidence in God, that he would look after him and that he would enable him to fulfill his purposes for him. So did Paul disregard the prophetic word of the Lord? Did he indeed? No, of course not. He just had the bigger picture that enabled him to interpret and apply the prophecy differently. As in my situation, it's great to know what God has already said, because what God has said, he will fulfil. And that has been my experience in my walk with Jesus through my life as a Christian. It gives such confidence, especially as you see things just unroll and unravel, just as God said he would. So I have to ask you, would you like to be able to hear God's voice? Would you like to hear the Spirit speaking to you like this? Would you like to receive prophetic messages? Would you like to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you? If you would, let me pray with you. So let me pray. Lord, we thank you that you have a plan for each of our lives. We thank you that you are communicating with us more than we realise. Holy Spirit, help us to hear your voice, to see what you're doing in our lives, to know and feel your presence with us daily and hour by hour. Lord, show us and teach us how to be your friend, walking so, close, so closely with you that that communication is more easily recognised by us as we grow closer to you. Amen.